Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Le Grand Boo. The Big Feast. With myself, Cole Smithy, and my co-host, Mike Lacey. Hi, and we're here with our special guest co-host, the New York-based artist, Valerie Troxler. Valerie, how are you today? Hi, I'm well. Thank you for having me. We are very excited to have you you on the show to talk about this movie as a, as a last minute addition to the podcast because Valerie why happened to have seen this movie as we did very recently and I had such a fun time watching with her talking about it I was like okay can you, can you just come on the show like this is a perfect thing because we want to guess as often as possible and how often does someone accidentally watch the movie with you so it was perfect so tell us about the beer, Mike. What are we drinking? Uh, we're drinking River Horse uh, Special Ale and American Amber, coming in at a tolerable five and a half ABV. This is uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to see where it's this a little is malty. Of, it's a little malty. It's coming like out of it. Ewing, New Jersey. I think that's uh, North Jersey, not that far from here, probably. So hopefully, there's no lead in the water. Well, I mean, it, it says it's it's a super fun ale. Is that no? Um. No, you're thinking of Guanas. Yeah, yeah. Is there a Guanas brewery? I, mean, I hope not. Probably Ir- iridescent. The only glow in the dark beer in the tri state area. Yeah, so they've got they they went for the the, the nine year old art. They've, it looks like they have a. a, a a talented nine or ten year old who is good at drawing hippopotami. I'm sure that there's an artist who says, "You know how hard it is to draw like a kid. This is actually way harder than drawing a photorealistic <laughs> hippopotamus." That's a mean looking hippo. He does not look happy. Do you think hippopotami are called river horses somewhere? Evidently. Does that person not know what a horse looks like? <laughs> <laughs> They're very different. Um, it's, well, uh, it, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's an IPA, obviously, it's got a little bit of bite. It's got a nice brown color. Um, I'm sorry, is it an IPA? It is, it's very hoppy, it doesn't say it's an IPA, but I think it is, um, definitely, uh, heavy on the hops. American Amber. Yeah, it's, it's is that a, technically it's a lager, a, it's actually, an, right? Yeah, I think so. Amber Ale. Amber well, cheers, Ale. everybody. Cheers. So... Have you guys seen any Nicholas Rogue's mo- movies other than this one? Any of Nicholas Rogue's films? I don't believe I, I don't have. think so. What's what's on the list? Well, he started out he co-directed this movie called Performance with Mick Jagger, which is a really crazy crazy movie. Maybe we'll maybe we'll go on a Nicholas Rogue tangent. Of course he did The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie. Have you seen oh. that? Oh. You know what I haven't, but in fact, that is, I, th- I that think that's I think that's know. the that's the movie he made before this one, if I'm not mistaken. So he obviously has a history of working with people who aren't traditionally actors, although we'll get into Art Garfunkel's background. Yeah, well, he was a musician he was, turned he was actors. a very experimental filmmaker, and uh, let me just pull him up real quick. But yeah, the the th- the trick about our Garfunkel that somebody told me, and it's you can't find this information on Wikipedia, uh, was that Art Garfunkel, while he was playing a lot of music as a boy with Paul Simon in high school, he was also studying acting, and so he had studied acting oh, for, for fifteen years before he did Carnal Knowledge, which was his first movie. Well, two Art Garfunkel movies deep on the podcast. Yeah, well, this it's is apparent. He really does have chops. It's not a fluke. No, not at all. He's he he's so amazing, very impressive in this movie. So, Val, what did what did you what do you what did you, what struck you about this movie? Oh, um, I just um, loved it from the opening credits when you know obviously this movie takes place in Vienna and. Um, I always appreciate like um, a, a film that qu- kind of uses its city and the architecture of the city and sort of shows it. And I guess it's in a way it's it's almost kind of eye candy, but it's still really nice. And then drawing on sort of um, the associations of like the fin de sel, um or Siak Viennese artists, you know, um, going over like the Klimt and the, the Egon Schiele paintings that keep coming up and... Um, all, I mean, just the, the sex violence was, like, really interesting. There's a lot of metaphors sort of in that. 
Um, there's a lot to unpack. You are a big fan of, of Clinton and Sheila, right? This yeah. definitely seemed to be something that, from the get-go, I thought Val would love this. What, what's the... Um, is there a connection that we're, we're trying to be oriented towards, do you think, that has to do with the context well, or the backstory of those artists? They keep they keep showing this Sheila painting over and over. Like, she has a book, and, like, um, maybe there's, like, a poster, but it's called Death and the Maiden, I'm pretty sure. And there is, you know, at the end, um, you know, where he's sort of... Well, I don't know how you guys do this. If you talk about the end, we, we, we leave it a little. We will eventually kind of talk about it, but go. Well, a but, bit that, but that painting, the, really, the, the characters look corpse-like. They're very yeah, gray. It, it's their their skin they, is very gray. They look like they've they've moved on. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, w- what do you think of when a movie is intertwining other works? In, in itself like this. I thought this was a wonderful example of it. A lot of times when films make deep homages to other films, the number of movies that reference The Wizard of Oz really explicitly is very boring, but using paintings like this is a, is a very fascinating, compelling trope. Well, it's a great start to the, to the movie because it, it, it gives you this, this very clinical feel of how the paintings are being shown. They're, they're not... They're not showing you. They're only showing you parts of the pieces of the paintings, parts of the paintings, what they want you to see, and so it sets the the tone of this movie, which is uh, it's very disconcerting. It's a very upsetting movie. I found it really disturbing myself. And this is this is the only second time I've seen it. It came out in 1980. Originally, it was it came out under the title Bad, Bad Timing, Essential Obsession, which is what I have always called it. Essential Obsession. Obsession. Because I think that tells a lot about the the story. I think that's a much better title than just Bad Timing. Because it is... Just Essential Obsession without the Bad Timing thing makes perfect sense. I don't know why this movie is called Bad Timing. Well, I think what people would, would consider bad timing if you were aroused and your and your lover was in a coma yeah i guess i guess it is not 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 i'm thinking about it for more than four seconds in addition to that but a matter of timing and when things took place in time is actually a big plot point in this film so i suppose maybe it's in reference to that it's Mm -hmm. it's unclear when what time the deaths or the the whole film is in flashbacks I'm just kind of remembering that we keep going from these, like, you know, these scenes of this, like, very um, lively, fun, and then, like, very um, tumultuous girl, and then her dead, or her almost dead body in the autopsy. Um, That's also... Yeah, it's 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 almost a murder mystery, this movie. Right. Right. Should we get into the plot a little bit? Yeah. So Alex Linden is Art Garfunkel's character, and he is he's a he's a, a teacher. He's a college professor. He's a psych. Is he a psychoanalyst? Is that his his title? He's a researcher. He says. Yeah. Of Freud, right? So it would be in a psychoanalytical uh, tradition. At least we see him at Freud's estate, as a value point out before we were filming or recording. They actually film in what is meant to be and likely probably is Freud's office with his couch. And he's, and he's a sociopath. He, I don't think he's capable of having... A, well, that's sort of the spoiler a, a little if, bit. If he's, ha- if he's capable of having an honest human relationship. And he treats his, his relationship with Teresa Russell's character, uh, Milena. Is that her? Milena? Milena. Milena! Yeah, the, I could, that's my couldn't, impression. Couldn't, well, get, couldn't get the tr- the Trump thing out of my ear every time he said Melina, <laughs> the Trump reference. But but he treats her as a, as a as a character study. He as a, as a like he's looking at a bug under a, a magnifying glass. He keeps he note takes notes on her, and he does this thing with the the color cards mm-hmm. where he 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 um, he analyzes her. We later see this. There's a shot of um, like the a descript a description on the inside of the book about the color cards, and mm-hmm. it 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 mentions how this is not a game. This yeah. is not a party game. Yeah, that this is a a serious psychoanalytic. Yeah, this isn't something test. to 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 use to bully people or to manipulate people. And I feel like in the same way with that. You know, at first we see them playing with the cards. It's kind of like that. He's a sociopath. Is really unfolding. 
Yeah. Um, like, we don't really know that from the beginning. What I assume the movie would be is something of a romantic drama where opposites attract, and he's going to learn how to cut loose a little bit, and she's going to be like, you know, responsibility is actually a turn-on and a good thing, and you should get involved with it. And it does not really go that direction. Well, he's such a cold fish. When they meet... She seduces him or attempts to seduce him at a party. They meet at a party. She's she's dressed in a, in a party dress. It's very revealing, and she puts her leg up and blocks him in the wall. It reminds against the hallway. It reminds me of of the scene in The Graduate, mm-hmm. uh, where Mrs. Robinson cocks her legs her leg up and. And Dustin Hoffman says, uh, you know, are you trying to seduce me, Mrs. Robinson? But Art it's, Garfunkel... It's really he, almost an homage. And, of course, the Garfunkel connection to that film is... Uh-huh. It's is, right is there. Fair. It's right there. But mm-hmm. he does, he's not having it. He doesn't care. He's not really interested in her necessarily. She writes her number on a box of matches and gives it to him. And she's really making all the effort. And he's being very prickly and and un and, and atypical for for how a normal man would react to such an opportunity well is, is she a student is this a what kind of party was this where are they it, like, it seemed no? it's it seemed like it was a uh, an art gallery maybe a, an art showing i don't know well the, the it crowd was in is, a public space the crowd is certainly intellectuals academics yeah. they they're, they're they're running in a similar circle i don't know if they're clear does it do we know what she's studying is she studying psychology or something i don't believe so. we have no idea she's kind of an artsy person uh but she's not she's married to an older czech guy czech guy and she frequently leaves vienna goes across the border and goes and hangs out with him but she's also very promiscuous and likes to likes to just have fun she's a party girl yeah the movie's very what we'd call now sex positive right she uh, has an understanding of her um, desires and really the person who she might be the only person she might be hurting is this husband of hers who definitely doesn't like to see her go and lets her go like on the bridge and he she gets out of the car with him and goes meets up with Garfunkel. That that's a really sad thing that I is that happening consistently or is that oh, one time that he, I don't think he's heard he's at the end he says to Art Gump, Gar, Art Gump, Garfunkel that if you um if you love this woman you know that she does this you have to be you have to put up with this kind of bullshit and we see also with her older husband that he has there is one um short scene where he has another woman there mm-hmm. do you remember that oh mm-hmm. right yeah yeah, yeah. He so a, he's playing he's, many young he's, girls he's but it seems like game. he he pays for this one at least Mm-hmm. And, we, and we were talking before the podcast started. His character is played by Denholm Elliott of the Indiana Jones films, who, for my money, looks exactly like the guy from <laughs> Rosemary's Baby, who plays Hutch. And his name I'm looking for is Maurice Evans. Anyway, they they're bearing as as men the kind of men that they are. They're they're very. Uh, paternal. They have a very paternal sensibility about them. They're, that they, they provide safety. You know, any woman is going to feel right at home with these men because they're not they're not erratic. They're not expressing any kind of irrationality. They're established guys, and I and I think that's the part of the appeal uh, for Teresa Russell's character. Uh, but I also think that she has a manic depressive bent to her psychology too because for some there's she certainly has a masochistic side to even be with this guy because Art Garfunkel's character treats her so poorly right you brought up the scene where she comes on to him it's this meat cute he's a cold fish and yet she's interested in trying to make something happen why is she into him what do you, what do you think what, what, what kind of vibe is is our Garfunkel given off at this party that makes her want to turn on him to him Val well they do have a lot of sex <laughs> yeah that's true as we see throughout the movie like passionate sex so maybe she has a need for that given uh, see, I she don't has th- a vibe I, about him I don't know if they have passionate sex to me the, the, the most passionate sex that they have uh-huh. is when she's unconscious we'll get that in a minute 
Uh, I did want to talk about the the time when when they they fuck on the staircase though because that's there's that that's the that that to me was a very telling that was intense. that's a very telling sequence because he goes over and clearly that's the only reason that, that that's the, his primary focus that's the main reason he's there and she's not in the mood so he, then he oh do, do I... then then he says well I'm just gonna leave and then she chases him down the stairway and and really lays it out and says oh is this all you want is this what you want and of course he, you know she entices him back up the landing and 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 they have sex on this on the staircase and it seems so it seems like i don't know there needs to be some sort of emotional upheaval for them to for him to be aroused that's when you get a sense that it takes right. it takes more than just normal situation for him to be aroused maybe she saw in him a sort of repressed person you know or she this, perceived a stone face right and she wanted to like break into that well he's he's very clearly an intellectual he's a college professor mm-hmm. so he, and he there's someone very cold and there's the the scene in the, toward the end where she talks about how you know you already have everything you already know everything and I think that I, I, somewhere in there, I think that's part of it is that, you know, the, he is a know-it-all. You know, and I forgot, this is, this is sort of referential to Vienna, which is known for its, the, peop, the Viennese are known for their, like, coldness and their kind of um, repressiveness. And there, there's actually a documentary, and I forget what it's called. It's called The Something Downstairs. Do you know it, Cole? Mm-mm. And it's about like Austrian sex fetishes mm. and all of these like really wealthy Austrian people who have like sex dungeons in their houses. But it's like the culture is kind of known. And what's it called? It's called the something downstairs. Huh. And it's about the dungeon downstairs. No. Hmm. Hmm. I wish I remember. Well, we'll, we'll figure it out. You, we'll, we'll, you, we'll, we'll see if we can come up with that. Is Garfunkel your prototypical Viennese person, or is he is he masquerading well, as one? He's maybe so because he's an American, but he's a psychologist. Um, they're referential, to, and he's you know a prominent psychologist working in a, at a university and like working inside of Freud's office. So it's sort of connected to that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he doesn't get into any. SNM activities, maybe that would be a release for him. He seems he, to have these sadistic he, ambitions that he doesn't get into any SNM activities. But I always wondered this, especially with that color card game. You know, was it that he was just analyzing her, or do you guys think that maybe he already knew that he would drive her towards well, this is committing yeah, suicide? Yeah, well, this is Mike and I talked a little bit about this. Last night Did we went, to the, we her went, went to the the Fox Searchlight party and hung out with Guillermo del Toro and Doug Jones and uh, Richard Jenkins. Just to drop a few names, Billie Jean King was there, and I was and I BJK and, and I was saying that that it, that I really did have the the sense that he was grooming her from the beginning mm. that he he knew exactly what he was doing from the start because he just comes off as such a calculated person and when the movie starts off uh we we see the investigation begin with uh harvey well before harvey Keitel, who's the detective the homicide detective who, who comes who eventually comes along when it's just art garfunkel and the uh admitting police officer and he seems too calm he's just too cool for school under these conditions mm-hmm. where the, this Teresa Russell's character has been brought in an ambulance in a coma she might already be dead they're trying to revive her we don't really we, we see that that there is some life in her but she's her her life is in the balance and clearly he he was with her but he just calls himself a friend and he's He's yeah, lying immediately. He's we lying immediately. He's, we know he's lying, even though we don't really know what the relationship is. 
We know that he has some reason to be. And he, deceptive. well, he's so he's so assertive about not knowing the time when she called him. She she called and had taken some pills and something that supposedly she had done before, so he didn't really take it seriously. But he's so evasive about time. He he just refuses to answer any questions about what time it was when she called or when he went over. Or, to to see to you know check on her condition or anything, and so we, yeah we know we know that he's he's lying, but he's he's just so cool and cold about it all. Were you so surprised, you guys, at at the end to see that he seemed to have machinations that were in in place? Did you throughout it have hope that he was going to break and and it be a better dude? Did you, did you have hope for him as a character? The only time I had hope for him was when they were in. Uh, did they go to India? Were they in India? We were talking. Were they? We were talking about that they were possibly in Morocco yeah. or like Tunis, Al- Algiers, or something. Algiers, yeah. Yeah, and 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 so when they're in this, I totally forgot that. We're in the, when they're when they're in that foreign land, and there's the snake charmers and all the crazy music and the stuff. Snake charmers. That's you know that's when I had some hope for them because she's really excited. She's loving every second of it. She's really happy, and he he proposes to her, and but she doesn't say the right thing, mm-hmm. and 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 immediately everything's wrong. Just as as when she comes across the border, when he meets her across the border, and you're hoping that oh this, this you know they're, it's a they're gonna reunite you know they haven't seen each other in a long time they're gonna be really happy and they're gonna kiss and everything's gonna be great but no he's just a prick and she ends there's the one time because she comes across they meet from across the border a couple of times in the movie and and there's the one time where she just go she leaves she goes back across the border like fuck you and mm-hmm. who could blame her because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. he's just He's so, I don't know, he's just so mean. He's not somebody that you're comfortable being around. She's clearly not comfortable being around him. It's structured, like I think one of you said before, like a mystery, um, a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. Yet it turns out that she doesn't die. And what it raises to me is the fact that uh, on top of sexual assault not being something that seems easy to prosecute something like i want to call it a a thought crime deeply manipulating someone driving them to do something to hurt themselves that's also not a crime what he's done to her this emotional abuse almost intellectual abuse these, these games that in it's constructed in such a way that we don't fully see it and then we sort of i'm sorry we reconstruct backwards what's been happening and it comes into uh, fruition. It comes to to crystallize this, to realize w- w- this game he's been about. It's it's very it's very brilliant. It has the structure of a mystery being solved, yet it's not a straightforward crime. It's not something that we think about as even technically a crime. Well, it's it's very inventively told. I like the flat the way that. Rogue uses the flashbacks. They're very jarring, and especially when they're doing the tracheotomy on her, you mm-hmm. you, ha- you it's a very visceral suspense. It's so hard to watch. You really feel bad. It really just makes you feel awful as an audience member for what this poor girl is going through. You know, she's definitely the the protagonist in the story. Th- this is a film that would be difficult to tell just in America. I think it's served so much by having an international location and cast and being able to go to different countries so easily as one can there. And Val, you've you traveled a lot recently. Did you have much connection to where it was being filmed or just this, this lifestyle, being able to hop between countries like this? Um, well, I was in Vienna not too long ago, but... Um I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that there is something <laughs> that is at least narratively useful about being able to cross borders. Literally, like the, the borders that are crossed in this in those scenes. Um, oh, I see what you're saying now. I, I've been watching um, a few movies that have been involving borders recently. I started watching 
uh, the spy that came in from the cold, and that uh-huh. opens at uh, Checkpoint Charlie. And it's black and white. Isn't it's it? black and white, mm-hmm. and I, th- I, th- I think Checkpoint Charlie showed up in a couple other movies that, that we've wa- watched. And uh, I think of a touch of evil that's infamously on the border. I think you named another movie that takes place on a border. Um, we were talking about Orson Welles. Um, and uh, it also takes place in Vienna. It's called The Third Man. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so her her personal bo- her sexual borders and are very like liminal. Um, I'm using them a lot with the with her husband, with our Garf- Garfunkel, with the sort of lovers that don't matter. And I think that that's similar to what you're talking about. There's sort of a metaphor there where they travel to many places, and also they're expats. Living in yeah, another country, yeah. and that's very really interesting. And, and, yeah, I really like like that aspect of it because she's this beautiful blonde American, but she's a, she's taken on the European way. She's in, completely embraced it all. She's got hairy armpits. She's married she, to some random old she's, Czech man. Yeah, she, she's crossing borders. She's very at ease with everything. She's at ease with herself. She's got a lot of agency. And he wants her to mar- to move in with him and marry him, and, and change her all of her behavior. Mm. She clearly it's very traditional. Where she is married, but it's so untraditional. She's not. She's not even a kept woman. She's married and supported financially, but she lives in another city and does whatever she wants. So does he drive her crazy? Does he drive her nuts? Because there's there's the scene. Our Garfunkel. There, there's the the go- the goth the gothic scene. Where she's go, she's using lipstick as eyeliner, mm-hmm. and she's she's chopped. She has all the candles. Yeah, she's, in the bedroom. And she's chopped the holes where her breasts are in the sweater, so mm-hmm. that she's wearing a t-shirt. But it's just it's crazy. She's gone cray cray. I forgot and about she, that. And she and she heaves all the wine bottles at him out of the window. And that at that moment, you really see that. It, She's broken character. She's gone. She's gone off the deep end. Well, also, she's an alcoholic, but she starts using. She has a prescription for some kind of amphetamines. Oh right, that's yeah. right. Yeah, it's, it's very specific about the and drug use and the behavior associated with it. That's a. That's a very. Those were very like erratic amphetamine sort of, the theatrical. Just being all, able to to decorate the whole apartment like that. Like that's a, a lot of energy. But it's, all, it's also 1980, and everybody was on. A shitload of drugs in 1980. That was the way. I'm. I. I. I you know, it was a year before I graduated from high school, and I remember, you know, people just taking any, you know, willy nilly anything that they get their hands on. This, this movie's perspective on it, though, is very specific and clearly was written from a point of view of knowing people who dealt with the excesses of these things and who weren't just crazy and like, like you know. Bad shit in love, but if this isn't a depiction of someone with bipolar disorder struggling with substance abuse, then it's w- very interestingly specific um, uh, telling of that. And you brought up, oh, everyone's using drugs at this point, and I think that's true, and it's in that context. Yet it has a very ahead of its time view of the specifics of what that looks like for certain kinds of people going too far. And it's it's sex positive in a very specifically modern way, yet in its own context. It's it's both in its time and far ahead of it in its analysis of what it's showing. Well, and there's there, there's also a little bit too much truth in the movie because while he was filming this movie, Art Garfunkel was dating this girl, Laurie Bird, who was in Two Lane Blacktop. Mm. It was a Monty Hellman film. And when he returned from shooting the film, he came back to his apartment in New York where she lived to discover her dead body because she, she had committed suicide. Wow. And so that, <clears throat> that sent him into a deep depression that lasted about 10 years. And I, uh, somewhere in eight, nine, about 1985, he was dating Penny Marshall for a while and she helped him help pull him out of some of that depression but you know there's a little bit too much too much truth in the movie in in regard to our our garfunkel's life that's another it's another brick in the wall of why this movie did not have a very wide release and reception because it seems like star probably wasn't excited to do well the p and that that wasn't it. it the company that that produced the film 
was a very conservative company, and and they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Yeah, read, your, read your script, buddy. <laughs> so when so you know Nicholas Rogue had had done Walkabout. Have you heard of this movie, Walkabout? No, is it Australian? Uh, yeah, it's an Australian film, and that was his second movie. That that was really his his first. He did performance, which he co-directed, and then and then Walkabout was his first film that he made by himself and that's about uh this you know walkabout in in australia is when the aborigines when they pass puberty part of their uh transition uh yeah into manhood is to go on walkabout which means that you go for three six months i don't know how much how long it was and you just have to survive the wilderness and become a man it's your right to passage and what happens is there's an Australian businessman who's successful. He takes his, his daughter, who's 12 or 13, and his son, who's probably 6 or 7, into the outback. And, and he's driving the little VW bug, and he's going to kill them. And he's shooting at them. And so they hide behind a rock, and so he kills himself. And they're stuck in the Australian outback. Walkabout. And that's why it's called Walkabout. And so Ooh. while the girl is trying to you know take care of her little brother, they don't have a chance. They don't stand a chance. But fortunately they meet an aborigine who's out on Walkabout. And mm. he befriends them and takes care of them. And of course, as will happen, she betrays him in the end. And uh, it's a beautiful film. But it's also it's also a very fraught film. Is he Australian, Nicholas Rogue? Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a it's a great movie. You know, we we could we could do Nicholas Rogue movies for a while. But anyway, back to this one and, and our, the reality of, of Art Garfunkel's situation. Uh, it, it's it, it really puts a, a a sad footnote on the movie that that's that that's what happened in his life after this because I think that he would probably would have gone on to do a lot more film acting if it hadn't been for that well let's talk about the 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 scene and truly the act of violence which has been honestly unparalleled in any of the movies that I can think of that we've watched this is one of the most shocking acts of of uh, Ra- rav- ravishing ravishment ravishment, ravishment. ravishment. As, um, that's what Har- as Harvey Keitel's detective uh, calls it yeah so, so let's, I, let's, loved, I loved that that was great ravishment yeah. Keitel is great he, he does this this whole Columbo it's the Harvey Keitel take on on Peter Fox Columbo he's sort of a Viennese Harvard educated Columbo long haired <laughs> He's the long-haired American who expat who came over. Is he to, American? To, he has such a yeah. strong accent. Oh, he's uh, so American. Is he? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, he's investigating this attempted suicide in a way that is very confusing to the audience, or is supposed to be. And he's interested in the time of the attempted suicide. One of the clues, and this is very murder mystery esque, and it's a bit out of place in the film because it, this is a lot of things slammed together is our Garfunkel had the radio on and it was tuned to the, to the late station to the late station but if he had arrived at the time he said there would have been nothing on the late station so he must have arrived and also late. he smoked an awful lot of Marlboro or earlier I might have it flipped around but he, Inspector N- N- how do you pronounce his name Natusil, Natusil. That's that's Cartel's character is Inspector Natusil. And what it turns out is he's that very mercurial inspector, very mercurial detective. Is it heavy, he, heavy smoker of these sort of of these he, weird clove you, type things. You, you you feel like like he he has some kind of premonition. He's able to look into his mind. And find things in the crime. Well, that's what, so like, yeah, he, he really seems to. It, it, at least he, it, he. That might not really be the case, but he's going to use that that technique, that behavioral tick, to try and get a confession. 
Because that's his thing. He wants to get a confession out of this guy. Mm -hmm. He wants a confession that he convinced her to kill herself or enabled the death to happen. And that he ravished her. And that he ravished her. But what's interesting is when she doesn't die, it's off the table. It seems like that he was looking for um, a homicide charge and also a rape charge. But once she survives, it's as if none of this matters. Which it's a loophole. A, it's a it, it, it's the loophole that, that I don't understand that why that's yeah, Alex off the hook. admits anything. Right. Is there a strong comparison being made between the investigative analytical styles of uh, Keitel uh, and um, Har- Harvey Keitel? Keitel. It, it just in its in its just singular Keitel. I really doubted myself there uh and garfunkel garfunkel so cold calculating hidden um, it's, it's thinking and these but really getting worn down in the end you know you can see the circles under his eyes are really dark by the end of the movie when Keitel's coming in for the kill and, and you can feel that that he that he might break that's a part of the parallel is that she breaks or she almost breaks you said is there a similarity between their styles of investigating him chasing her, investigating her, and um, the investigator looking at Garfunkel. You can imagine that he hates this crack. investigator. He hates what's being done to him. He hates being strong armed. You know, he's. I think in the future we'll have a term for what Kaitel is doing. It's called like getting Muellered. He's there's <laughs> there's an investigator breathing down his neck that he can't escape from. That is just trying to get him to admit what he's done. Well, I want to talk about the scene because clearly this Art Garfunkel's Alex Linden, Professor Linden, is a very tightly wound individual with weird ideas about voyeurism and and ex- and, and emotional I- expression. And he can't admit his his affection for her, his love. He doesn't say I love you. Is that right? Yeah, he, to- yeah we don't get any of that until... He wants her to marry him, but in a contractual say yes until she's way. until that, she's right? until mm-hmm. she's comatose, and it's a shocking, it's a very shocking scene of lovemaking where I wouldn't call it that. It's, it's uh, yeah, I don't know what you call it, but I think rape, right? It's, yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's Cosby esque. It's uh, yeah. I, I was, it is Cosby esque. I, I, I was. Talking. I guess I guess that's that, that's the real truth is that this is a this is a direct view into the mind of Bill Co- the acts of Bill Co- the crimes and sins those of, Bill, of Bill Cosby. Of those types of acts, which this is the only way that this guy can get his rocks off the you know the way he really wants to. I think the idea of a man wanting to control a woman is a very commonplace. Um, vision of what a relationship can be like but when you drive it to its farthest farthest extent to control another person is to want them he doesn't want any participation at all he doesn't want her conscious so we have seen movies with uh, sex acts like this you know what movie I'm talking about do you? that we've watched on this podcast tell me Dahmer and in that way it makes it we talked about this is that um, you know it's a bit there's something like necrophilia mm-hmm. in this total objectification of her body objects um, aren't alive having sex with a corpse or someone who's going to be a corpse has no presence and then the continual that juxtaposed with her corpse like body during this pre autopsy Pre autopsy, you know, it you know, leads trying, right into that. Yeah, it's so Dahmer like because he's made a love zombie. It's uh-huh. that liminal state that he wants. I, I think he actually doesn't. He could have hit her over the head. He could have shot her and had sex with her dead body. He wants her alive but helpless. Mm-hmm. And all those shots of her attempting to be revived and in that middle state. And he wants her to be responsible for all of it too. Right. He doesn't. He, he, he's. He, He's very methodical in the way that he goes about it. And that's why I feel like he really is grooming her mm-hmm. throughout the, the story to get her to this place because he he's he has psychoanalyzed her to a point where he knows that he could, with the right adjustments, he can get her to be a little suicidal. 
because he knows that she's got that she's taking drugs and it seems that to me that he really pushes her in that direction and that's that's a lot of what the the suspense of the story is about is is how he's doing doing all of this in this very abstract way this weird manipulative stuff that you know you see people do stuff like this in in relationships or you know you have these experiences where people how people nudge you in certain directions Mm -hmm. about you know how they want you to respond and how they want you to behave in a relationship and that's that that's a lot of the suspense of, of this story well how do you think this relationship compares to the relationship between the psychoanalyst and his wife in antichrist well, they're very different because at least in, in, in Antichrist, Willem Dafoe's character comes off as being very caring. I never gave him that credit. I, th- I th- thought of him in that movie exactly how we're talking about Garfunkel in this movie. And also in Garfunkel's character, Dr. Linden, when he, when he, he keeps this, this file on her and he leaves it on his desk so that right. she can find it. He's not trying to hide it. Because that's part of the game, right? That's all part of the game, yeah. That's an element of the movie that was... The the plot was a little fuzzy to me. He seems to be doing psychoanalytical reports for the government as a contractor. And coincidentally, his girlfriend and her husband are assigned to him. It is it was a bit... Wait, is that what happened? It's a little unclear. I thought that he went and sought out information on them because he... He could because he was in that position to just oh, use those that definitely archives. Makes more, that definitely makes more sense yeah. than that coincidence. But he yeah, he has some he has some contracting with the government that he's doing. Um, was, you know, we're, we're getting towards the end here, but takeaways. One, men suck. Uh, two, psych- <laughs> psychoanalysis. Is there a, for a movie that got a permit to film in Freud's office, is there a big F you to psychoanalysis in this film? Or Did, is, is it do you know that for a fact? I don't know it for a fact. Certainly, okay. it, it seems like it. Have you ever been to, to, to Freud's, uh, the Freud Museum, uh, no. Val? No. No. Um, <laughs> For some reason, I was very confident that it was real. Yet. I don't know. Um, but is is this a, a strike against psychoanalysis, or is it just a, a parable about uh, uh, sociopaths and to watch out for them? Well, I don't know. That's that's maybe part of the mystery of the movie. I think that there's the there's a lot of questions that this movie brings up Didn't that that you have to that make you feel really uncomfortable while you're watching it we, and, we watched, and after you've watched we it. We watched Century of the Self for this podcast, right? That's the 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 Adam Curtis uh, doc that talks about um, psychoanalysis. Did we watch that, or did we or or not? I think we did. I'm pretty sure we did Century to the Self. Yeah, and that certainly makes a strong case against the normative uh, social and sexual values that psychoanalysis, for all of its seeming kinkiness, I think there's a lot to be said of those who want to study and measure human beings may not necessarily have the best intentions for what to do with those examinations. Well, there's the one scene where he has eyeliner, and then there's the scene when he's on the bus, and he seems like he like there's some, some gay tendencies coming out in him. He's he's got he's got he's got a lot going on. This guy's got some 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 stuff happening in his little brain. I was gonna say that the, the thing he told me is, is that he came home and his his girlfriend had killed himself. That's the darkest Killer shit. Self. I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Can you imagine after after you filmed this movie and yeah. then you go home and your girlfriend you're like, killed herself? You're like, you, you think he like gets home and he's he's like taking off like his jacket and he's like, babe, it's so glad to be home. I was just filming the most intense fucking movie. Oh, I didn't even I didn't even want to tell you about it on the phone, but so like, let, let me tell you about the last scene and he like. Well, let me go on further. Laurie Bird killed herself when she was twenty five, and so did her mother. Whoa. Mm. I mean, that's roughly the age of Teresa Russell's character in this film, I believe. Yeah. There- Teresa Russell is, is magnificent in this movie. She's so great. Just a really... St- everyone, all the performances are, 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 are terrific. But, her, but hers... She, she has a lot to do. So, is this a... Is this a recommend, you guys? You're going to push friends to, to see this film? 
Let's go around. Val, what do you think? I would. Yeah, it was great. What would you tell them before they watch this, this movie? <laughs> to get them excited or to warn them? Either like, way. Like, um, people get raped. <laughs> <laughs> if you're fidgety, don't watch it. <laughs> TW is all over this one. All the trigger warnings. It's great. Um, you know, there's lot. There's lots of like Egon Sheila paintings. Mm. Or really just like the same one over and over again. You know, there's... I don't know, I've said enough. Okay. Yeah. So, th- so this <laughs> film was released in, in 1980 as Bad Timing, Essential Obsession. And it was pulled after uh, just a few weeks, I believe. And I remember I was living in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and I had an art house cinema, The Biograph, about two, out, two blocks from me. I lived practically on the campus of VCU. And I was so curious about this movie. And I think it was out of commission until Criterion picked it up in 2005. So I'm guessing that I saw it for the first time maybe 10 years ago. But I remember it being a very different movie than the one that we just watched. There's a lot going on in this movie. And it's it's, it's so complex. It's so weighted with all sorts of themes and and Nicholas Rogue's structure is very inventive. I think it's not a movie that you could see only once is what I would say about this movie. Uh, Val and I watched this movie a week and a half ago at most and partly because I enjoyed it so much and partly because it's so dense I feel too distant to have competently talked about it right now which is not true for for many movies and it's not that it doesn't stick with you there's just there's so much to have washed over you and a lot of it is very intense and you, you do a bit of trying to to, to to push it down a little bit so this is definitely a um if if you want something that is intense and thought-provoking and is going to push you to an edge and succeed in a way that a film like irreversible i think is attempting to go to yeah but to not just throw exploitation uh, exploitation uber violence at you and ho- make that do its work this uses fantastic very human very specific portrayals of characters that are absolutely archetypes that you have met and interacted with and can relate to and takes it to a place of shock and horror that you couldn't have imagined it's a beautifully shot film anthony richmond's cinematography is is beautiful it's a great transfer too um we we watched uh we rented it from amazon all of us right yeah and um yeah it's real the colors are, are very lush um it's if you if you're a if you're a cinephile you'll 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 know it when you see it it's an instant classic the first time you see it you know this is this is something really special movies like this do not come along no they just don't there never be another movie like it it's really it's it's in it's in a class by itself yeah and i and i give that that we we talked so much about our garfunkel he deserves it but um i wish we could do another episode just about Teresa russell in it she is what takes this to another level if you are not completely enamored with her uh, scared for her uh, excited for the things that are are happening that aren't terrible in her life then all of the drama is for naught but she is someone that you just want to know and feel like you do know so when what happens to her happens to her it has this weight that is really hard to replicate in a film yeah and i I watched a a movie called deadlier than the male which is a great M A L E. That's or? right. It's it, it's it's a spy spoof movie. Okay. On the beach in Cannes, when Quentin Tarantino was the head of the jury, mm-hmm. and Teresa Russell was on the jury. Oh. And so Teresa Russell and and Quentin Tarantino sat in their their lawn chairs on the beach and got drunk on wine about fifty feet from where I was nice. watching, watching nice. the movie with them. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I have I have great memories of, of Teresa Russell in person too. Love it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for listening. Please uh, feel free to visit our Patreon page, which you can find on colesmithy.com, and you can see all of the archived episodes of 
Le Grand Bouffe, The Big Feast. And to pledge your support, $5, $10, $20 a month, or whatever you can afford, would be greatly appreciated. And please remember to turn your cell phones off when you're walking, driving, riding a bicycle, or watching a movie.